of this thing right in the middle of my head. <laughs> Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Fantastic. How are you? Uh, a little less than that. A little nonplussed tonight. I'm not a fan of the avalanche, and I'm not a fan of pissing away games, David. I'm not a fan of that, but <laughs> it was a hell of a game. It was and a good I game. actually, I actually, I, there's a listen, everyone, as everyone who listens to this podcast know, I hate a lot of teams, mm-hmm. but I admire the abs, Bruce. Mm-hmm. I just can't bring myself to hate a team with Kale McCarr and Nathan McKinnon. They are such fantastic players. They're Canadians. They're going to be on Team Canada mm-hmm. um, one day. So, uh, no, I I admire the Avs. They are a great hockey team, and they play a very appealing style of hockey. Um, they run and gun. They attack. They're fast. They're skilled. Bruce, what's not like? What's not to like with the Avs? Just. They know they <laughs> swept Edmonton in the conference finals in the two years ago, and I developed a mad on for a few of their players, including McKinnon. I have to say, I admire well, McCarr. McKinnon kind of gets my goal. He's a, he's a fabulous player, and or, yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm mistaken that. Yeah, he he is dirty. He's a tough, dirty player, but so are a lot of my favorite players. So I. I Anyway, maybe I'll maybe I'll learn to hate them like you, Bruce. If maybe I'll be a better Oilers fan. They keep beating the Oilers in overtime. Over yeah, they and do. Over and over again. Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things, two numbers podcast, and I think we decided I'm going first because I'm talking about um, the Oilers' first goal of the game, and the Oilers. Um, the grade A shots in this game were um, 18 to 14 for the Avs, but the subset of five alarm shots, we had it as eight to five for the Oilers. So the Oilers had the the better of the very best shots, but the Avs had more uh, of, of the good shots. So this was a very even game with lots of great shots on net and some spectacular goaltending by uh, Skinner and Alexander Georgiev. The Oilers were behind this game one nothing heading into the third period and it was kind of worrisome because the abs the orders were getting their chances but georgiev was just so good mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you got the californian of all goals the californian and it was as we call it here at the cult of hockey bruce it was um a, just a fantastic play by warren fogel first the puck's coming around the boards and he keeps it in along the boards at the blue line and Great charges point. down the wing and hammers a really hard shot from outside. And uh, there's a rebound and the abs defenseman just, all he can do is just shoot it away. And it goes to Evan Bouchard at the point, <coughs> excuse me, who immediately puts it on net towards net and Fogel's stick stuck around the net. He gets a stick on it and puts a very difficult <coughs> tip shot past George F to tie the game at 1-1. It was a fantastic play all around by Warren Fogel. His, Mm-hmm. Uh, career high 16th goal. Mm-hmm. Bruce, he's become him and McLeod. The Oilers have two really solid second line wingers, if you ask me, in him and Ryan McLeod. To me, that question's been answered. The Oilers have those players. Like, you know, we'll see how the third line guys, Kane and Brown, do. And the, and the fourth line guys, it was uh, Perry and Yanmark tonight. Mm-hmm. But um, Fogel and McLeod present a ton of of difficulty for the opposition because they're big, fast, and skilled. And they're both playing the best hockey of their NHL careers right now. That play typified it for Warren Fogle. Yeah, and a tiny shout-out to Ryan McLeod, who uh, he helped to force the turnover by pressuring the guy. And the guy just sort of had to clear it away from the front of the net, and he wound up dumping it straight to Bouchard on the point because he didn't have time to to – take up the puck and, and you know, make a play with it. He just got rid of it because McLeod was kind of all over him. And, and uh, But certainly the main play was a good outside shot by Bouchard, but the main play was actually Fogel keeping it in at the blue line. I thought that was a terrific 
play by uh, number 37, and then uh, he followed through by going to the net. Indeed. Just three or so minutes after Edmonton had appeared to tie it on a goal that was called back for a distinct kicking motion. Yes, yeah, so you're allowed to kick the puck Jack Hyman. for a pass, but not for mm -hmm. a goal. So, um, mm -hmm. and we'll be talking about that in a second. Bruce, it's your good thing. Yeah, well, I'm going to go with the second goal. Surprise, surprise, given the order that we are doing things in. And specifically the play made by Corey Perry uh, that helped set up the play, play when he appeared to get his stick kind of ripped out of his hands. Now, the Colorado guy might say he hooked him, or was it Manson? He was having sure. it all night. And, uh, and Perry's stick came out, and Perry's stick was still sort of flying through the air, and he was sort of looking at the referee for the, for a call, but at the same time, he was controlling the puck behind the net, and with his skate, uh, he kicked it out to uh, Matthias Janmark, his, uh, his winger on the play, and uh, Janmark circled around to the top of the circle, and he fired one towards the net, and uh, newcomer Sam Carrick was able to... Uh, pounce on the loose puck right in the slot and pound it home for, I believe, his ninth of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah his eight. ninth of the season. So not bad. I mean, obviously, his first as an oiler, and Perry had that puck in his glove before he even joined the the, the celebrations, his uh, first goal as an oiler. But I thought Perry's play there, the way he kept his head and just thought, well, I got no stick, so I got two skates. I'll just pass the puck with one of them, and he made a you know, he did what he intended to do. He kicked the guy to whom he wanted to kick it, and then he went to retrieve his stick. And uh, from the chaos that followed all of, all of that sequence, uh, Carrick wound up alone in front and able to slam it in. So fourth line kind of goal, grind it out and get a bounce and bang it in. What do you think of Carrick? <sighs> uh, I'm, I have mixed... Uh, a mixed take on him, but I like some of the things he brings for sure. You know, when he was, let's see now tonight, uh, he played eight and a half minutes. Uh, that was his only shot. He had three hits, a block shot, four out of nine on the dot. So, you know, mediocre, but, uh, and he played a little bit of the one penalty kill. There was only two p power plays in this game, one for each team, and both were killed off, and Carrick's shift was uneventful as as far as I remember. Like he's a low event player, uh, in the sense that there's probably not going to be a lot of goals scored while he's out there, but he's a he's an event player who shows up on the event event summary because of his hitting game and his uh uh you know his play without the puck, which happens a lot when he's out there, I've noticed. The other team seems to have the puck a lot of the time. But um it's too soon to form a hardened opinion on him, but uh, uh, I like some of what I see. I'll just I, I think there. it's a little early too, because 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 his attributes may not be. He's not that big. He's not that fast. He's not that skilled, right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't do any kind of obvious things <laughs> that get your attention for a forward. But he might be really smart and really tough and really solid defensively. He's definitely so, tough. So I want to see. I really want to be able to gauge his defensive play in the defensive slot for a while. And same with Henrique. I, mm -hmm. I'm actually have quite a strong first impression of Adam Henrique. I like his game quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think he's a really smart and a highly skilled player. He's not fast, but he, I, you can already see his skill. And I think he's, I think he's smart defensively. Um, with Carrick, it's a little hard to tell. I mean, I, at this point, I prefer Derek Ryan in the lineup, but um, I can see why they, you know, they're obviously they're going to give Carrick a chance. We should know, Bruce, that Vincent DeHarnay got in a fight with Josh Manson and did not return to the game. Right. He was on the bench but never played a minute so in the third, third period. period. So that's not a good sign at mm -hmm. all. Um, although, yeah, I mean, they haven't really – well, they've traded for Stetcher, who is a right D, and they have an extremely capable young player in Bakersfield in Philip Broberg. So um, we'll see what happens there. I mean, I suppose it's not totally impossible – that um, uh, uh, Knobloch decided that 
you know, DeHarnay missed the first few minutes. I don't know exactly what time he got out of the box, but it would have been at least four and a half minutes into the third period. And they'd already by then established a five-man rotation, and they just went with it for the rest of the period. Had they scored by the time he got out of the penalty box? Do you recall? Maybe uh, if they'd already scored to tie it, maybe he just wanted to keep that going. Well, too. the goal was at 5.46, and the, the time that he was eligible to get out of the box was 4.25. So I don't know if there was okay. a whistle in between. Right. It would be in the play-by-play, -play, but I don't know that for sure. Okay. Bruce, what's your bad thing? Are we going to go in order there, too? Uh well, if yours yeah, is one of I the guess goals, we should go first. We, yeah, we should go in order there too. My bad thing was the play of the third pairing of Cody CC and Brett Kulak. And usually um, in a recent post, I just, I remarked on how Kulak has played an absolutely, he's just had an excellent season. Um, I mean, there had been talk a few months ago, of maybe trading him to get cap space at the deadline. And we had mused about it. But as, you know, fairly quickly, it became obvious that that was just madness, that kind of idea, because of how well he was playing. But tonight was not his night, especially that first goal against Bruce. Um, wow. Uh, it was yeah. just one of those rush goals against where he made, I don't know, like he, he wasn't really even that close to making the play. They're breaking out with the puck. They get it to the neutral zone. It's a rush. He's back. Cece's back. Everything's under control. Dreisaitl's back. Looks like nothing's going to happen. Three guys back. Three guys rushing. And then Kulak all of a sudden peels off and goes after the puck carrier in the neutral zone. He's not even close to making the play. Yeah. To getting him. And the pass has made Walker, Sean Walker, who had a, had a, made a hell of a good impression. Mm -hmm. um, he rushed into the open ice. Um, took the pass, went in, charged in fast, and and made a great shot to beat Stuart Skinner. Um, Drysaddle was even with Walker, at, uh, and then at, not by the time Walker broke into the zone. Well, Walker, but Walker really, had inside position when he, when he took the pass, and he kind of kind of shrugged Leon off and yeah, got a well, step on him, and that was all he needed. He's pretty quick. Ho hockey happens fast, and it, mm -hmm. much less on Lee on that one um, than on Kulak. Ones. Because Kulak, <laughs> Kulak, one of the other goals against that we're going to talk about. Mm. But Kulak, he had all he had lots of time in hockey terms to make. He just made a veteran player made a really poor read. And it was yeah. the kind of read that we saw earlier in the year constantly as the Oilers were losing and mm -hmm. digging themselves such a hole early in the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kulak's hardly made that kind of mistake all year oh, long. That's but right. he, he sure made it made right. One there. So then he also allowed on the second goal, he also allowed the pass into the slot, but that was the least of the, that was one of the problems on the um, tying goal for um, the bad guys, but it, it was, it, it definitely was one of them. CC's weak pass up the wall was one of the problems on that goal too. The Oilers' failure to clear the puck about 30 times in the brief yeah, was so three minutes between 2-1 and 2-2. Two, two. I must have screamed, get it out of here, about eight times at my TV on a two or three different sequences. I just could not get the damn puck over the blue line. Cody, Cody CC since the All-Star break, has not played well. And this was a really rough game for him as well. He, you may recall, there was a penalty shot by uh, Jonathan Drouin that was caused by CC. He's leading the attack and he decides that he's, Connor McDavid at the offensive blue line and he tries to make a move and the puck's stripped off of him. And um, there's a breakaway by Drouin. Because of it, Kulak's caught up ice on that one as well. And um, Nuge, was it, that got the stick in there and it was the right call? Yeah, it was the right call. And that, it, it was, I knew Skinner was going to save it. I had a really good feeling he was going to save it. But um, Cody Cece was caught out on that play. He was caught out, he, as you mentioned, on the tying goal, he made a very weak clearance that kind of McDavid couldn't get to, and Drysaddle was out of the zone. He had blown the zone. Um, and they kept it in, and then they scored. And so that was on CC as well. CC made four major mistakes on grade-A shots against an even strength, not one contribution 
four and Kulak was zero and three in that same category. So these were poor games for both of these players. I mean, CC was close to, you know, getting a two, but I, I settled on a three out of 10, but you know, Bruce, um, yeah, you mentioned just before we came on, we were talking about this and like the orders being a little slow and the owners do have some slow veteran players and Cody CC at this point is kind of one of them. Like, Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and I just think to beat the abs, mm. we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's let, we'll get to this in a second. Yeah. yeah okay. This is our conundrum. Um, Bruce, yeah. um, what is your bad thing? Yeah. Uh, I got a few, but I'm going to zero in on one, which was the game losing goal against with 0 0.5 seconds left in overtime. And just to boil it down to the nub of it, I think that goal was scored because their number 29 played to the buzzer and our number 29 didn't. Yeah. And it's a simple, like it was a nothing play. The puck was shot into the corner. McKinnon went in after it. Bouchard took a real lousy angle to him and McKinnon just spun out on his backhand side and he made a pass across the face of goal. And... Arturi Lekin and flat out beat Leon Drysaddle to the net. And Drysaddle was in good position and he just sort of thought, oh, the clock's winding down, nothing's happening. Oh, it's in the net. Oh, there's still 0 0.5 seconds. Left. Oh, we lost. And I hope he does the next. Oh, my fault. My bad. I owe you guys one because that was, you know, to me, that's just unacceptable. You got to play to the buzzer. This game was. 65 minutes and they played 64 minutes 59 and a half seconds and they forgot to play the last half second and it's just unbelievably frustrating they had was... shut mckinnon out it was, his streak was over till that happened and and just kind of a gift here you know, lekkonen's hustling and, and we're not hustling and bam that's the hockey game and it's just not good enough Leon, you're better than that. Yeah. Bruce, there's two forwards on the ice who I don't trust defensively. There's Leon and there's Evander Kane. And in the last minute of the of the game, Kane made a bonehead play where, where they were, you know, Janmark's rushing it in, mm -hmm. and there's two two oilers on the attack, and then Kane just said, you know, it's not an offensive play at all. There's nothing mm -hmm. much happening. And Kane decides, oh, I'm going to charge in there too. Behind and the because he line. does that, and against the Avs, the Avs were constantly – turning defensive stops into three on two rushes. They yeah. do it quicker than any other team in the NHL. They do it automatically. They do it like lightning and they did it there and they get a great shot at, on net with 30 seconds left because of Vander Kane, just, instead of, of instead of just, in, yeah, instead of saying, staying high in the zone, mm -hmm. like the third man, he moves yeah. in. Leon and Evander Kane are not trustworthy defenders in my well, opinion. And Kane, I, and they, they are such great players in, in so many ways but they have those moments, both of them, where they go for offense and they give up on defense. Well, in the 2-2 tie, or any score tie, in the last minute of regulation, uh, there's four rules. Defense, 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 offense. You go for offense only if it's there, like the Avs did when the Oilers got three forwards caught deep in the offensive zone. But if you give up a goal in the last minute of the game, it's basically one and a half standings points. And if you yeah. score one, it's half a standings point because you would have had a 50% chance to get that point in overtime of the shootout anyway. You just cannot give up a, uh, a game winner and the dying embers of regulation time. And that was just a, a horrible play by Kane. Like, what was he thinking? Like, he's a veteran. Doesn't he know, like, the Batman point? And, you know, you just don't take chances in that situation, unnecessary chances. And becoming a third forward, going behind the icing line when your other two guys are all jamming around the crease, it's just there's no reason for it. But there's also no reason to get back to my bad thing. There's no reason for not skating. I mean, what I prefer to see with like five seconds left in a game is tackle the guy and take the freaking penalty rather yeah. than give him a gift shot on net. And this is from a team who lost Saturday in Buffalo twice. With two seconds left in overtime, once they gave up a goal, they got it gifted back to him on a, on a cheesy offside call, and they celebrated by giving Buff Buffalo another 25 bell chance with two seconds left in the second rendition of overtime, and they learned nothing 
because this is the very next game that they got that's in overtime. Same damn thing. Two seconds left. Oh, let's give him a free shot. Oh, man. Hello? Wakey, wakey. Oh, yeah. And they played hard. You know, this was a hard game. It was. I mean, and Leon played hard. Much more of a, yeah, he did. And it makes it that much more of a piss off for Oilers fans to see a lazy play like that cost them a hockey game that the team worked so hard in. And I, I would imagine that there's a few guys on the team pretty upset. And I would dare say Leon is one of them because he's a proud guy. And I hope that he. Uh, Oh, he responds in a positive fashion because that's just not, it's not good enough. Yeah. I'm just hoping in the playoffs that they both make up their minds. Like they're going to mm-hmm. stop doing those things and stop yeah. and just, just play defense like they've never played it in their lives because they realize now that's the only way the orders will win the cup. So that's what, that's my hope. And uh, we'll see if it happens, Bruce. My, uh, Run to the numbers now, I think. My yep. number. My number is Leon's just not numbers in the game. He had a really super high event game. Or not super high event game. He so on grade A shots at even strength, Bruce, he helped create seven grade A shots at even strength, which is a remarkable number. He he had a really solid night on the tack. He sent in Nugent overtime. Um yeah. with a very he won the battle on the board, sent in Nuge. He, he earlier in the game he had made a brilliant pass backhand pass I think to set up I think it was backhand to set up Fogel at the side of the net for a five alarm shot um, but there was the de- the defensive mistake so another of his numbers is minus three on That's goals insane. at even strength and he he was he made mistakes on every one of those plays we already went over the first we've we've been over all three of them he. You know, he he was the minus three was an earned minus three. Often yeah. it isn't, especially for a forward, but um, he earned it. He earned it. You he know, probably and then, earned a couple at the other end, but those didn't come. But in the meantime, the defensive lapses wound up in goal lights. Yeah, and um, the final number that I will focus on with Leon is. Um, 14 and seven in the face-off circle. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he, there was some, uh, you already, I think you mentioned his ice time, 2310. 53 altogether. Oh, mine's not updated yet for some reason. Let me just well, hit the update button. Sometimes they update and it, they change it after the game sometimes. So mine might be. 2353. Yeah, it's 2353. So 27 for, shifts, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah well, his, his event summary, all of the, all of the columns have an entry in it, which is a high event game of different kind. Four shots, one that was blocked, one that he missed the net, four hits, one giveaway, two takeaways, a block shot. And as you mentioned, 14 out of 21 for 67% on the dot. Like he was all over this game, but his defensive lapses are basically the story at the end of it. It's I'm sad to you. say, but if, yeah. Yeah, you got to get that part of the game going. You want to be Anzi Kopitar? Play 200 feet for 65 colon zero zero minutes if need be. Yeah, Kopitar does. He's a solid defensive player. You want to be, want to be Alexander Barkov? Play 200 feet for 65 colon zero zero minutes if you need be. Not 64, 59. Indeed. Bruce, what's your number? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm going to go with a lousy set of possession numbers from the uh, Oilers' third line. This is greatly concerning to me in a matchup like this because Colorado's three deep in lines and Edmonton needs to be two. Uh, I'm just going to do shots on goal and high dangers. Adam Henrique, this is from uh, this is from Natural Statric, of course, and they're high dangers in our. Uh, Great A's are not the same thing, but there's considerable overlap. Anyway, shots with Adam Henrique on the ice, 2-4, 15 against. Uh, Evander Kane, 2-4, 15 against. Connor Brown, 1-4, 13 against. And then the grade A or high danger uh, chances, which I think are are, are, uh, shot attempts from good places. For Henrique, 1 4, 13 against. What? For 13? Kane, 1 4, 12 against. And for Brown, 1 4, 8 against. It's like awful, awful. Now, 
I could say that those are some of those shots probably weren't on net, probably weren't just obviously the fault of the forwards because we didn't we didn't particularly. Um, well, Kane uh, was minus two. Like he made yeah. two mistakes on grade A shots. Right. Henrique made not one, and um, yeah, one Brown on made field. not one. And yeah. Brown set up Kane for an absolutely great shot where he hit the crossbar. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't, yeah, that was the that was the one great a or high danger chance for. I'm pretty sure. But the takeaway is the puck spent the entire time in Edmonton's end of the ice. That's that's I'll you agree know. with that aspect of it. Uh, yeah, you got to create good. something. You got to get the puck in the neutral zone. You got to get into their zone. You got to forecheck. You know, it's, it's a 200 foot game, not a 60 foot game. So three um, veteran players. Who've mm-hmm. achieved a lot in the NHL mm-hmm. could be a good line. Yep. Like I know it's not a fast line. I like it on paper. But Kane's not Kane and Brown aren't slow. Kane's not a slow player. He's not particularly agile, but he's not slow on a straight line, especially when he's going in on the attack. Brown is a a, a fast enough player in both directions. He's fairly fast. He's above average skater or at least average. Henrique is maybe a little slower, a bit below average, but like this this should have the they should have the makings of a really good third line here and um we'll see if they can figure it out because if if they don't well let's move on to our conundrum here bruce the conundrum is can can the how are the orders going to match up against these abs in the playoffs and the obvious issue is the one that you raised is team speed and um i just get the feeling bruce that if edmonton doesn't integrate philip broberg and dylan holloway into their lineup for the playoffs against the Avs, that Oilers won't be able to keep up with the Avs. That they're going to need, they're going to have to take a chance and trust in a couple younger players who are really freaking fast, who can skate with the Avs and who can make plays. I think um, I, 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 they're going to. I think they they've got so many of these older veteran guys now who are gritty players. I like them. But you, you're going to need some more speed against the Avs. I'm convinced of that. And I really think Broberg and Holloway should be in the lineup. Against the Avs, I would take out CeCe at this point and put in Broberg. And I would take out, um, for Holloway, I'd take out Carrick. And I'd put in Holloway. And um, what do you think? Goal scoring hero, Sam Carrick? Yes, or I'd take out Perry. Uh, or, yeah. Carriker Perry, and I would go with, and I like Corey Perry's game just fine, but, you know, or take out, I think Brown's going to be good by then. He's coming on. So for me, the obvious choices are Carrick and CC. Now that could change, but I just think the orders need to be faster. Yeah, well, bringing in youth is one way to introduce speed. Uh, if we're talking specifically about a playoff matchup against Colorado, which would most likely yes. happen in round three, were it to happen at all, barring an Edmonton slide into a wild card spot and, and an earlier meeting up with the Avs. Uh, both teams are full of veterans. Neither, te- neither team has any entry-level contracts on the team, right? That's what um, Broberg and, and Holloway are, yeah. is entry-level guys. The youngest skater on uh, uh, Colorado is Casey Middlestadt. And he's 25 years old. And wow. the second youngest skater is Kale McCarr, and he's also 25 years old. And he's played, uh, uh, they both played over 300 NHL games, the youngest guys on their team. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're really strongly veteran. So the idea of bringing in younger speed is nice in theory, uh, but you might be paying a different price for it against uh, on such a veteran lineup. I mean, that they're in that sense, they are like the Oilers in that they've got really no... Uh, I think maybe their backup goalie is... Uh, yeah, when, when they won the Cup, though, Bruce, the Avs, the, you know, had young defensemen. Sometimes mm-hmm. you just have to go with your young players. Yep. you gotta, you no, got to take true. that chance. It, it is... I'm not saying it's not a gamble. It's a gamble to go with Holloway and Broberg. But I just think that's how you win. You're gonna. You have lots of really. Sh- Come on, McDavid is a veteran player. Dry, these are veteran yeah. players. Absolutely. All of their Nurse, Ekholm, 
they they, they are they've just got so many veteran players. Like, do you have do they have to be everybody? I I think you you're going to need some speed. And this we saw that tonight again and again and again. We saw the Abs take off on the orders and the orders couldn't keep up. And um, the, you know they were creating odd man rushes out of nothing because of their speed. You're going to need faster yeah. players now, and and you might have to. Tell Holloway, don't take any chances. Play a defensive game. If you see an offense, if you get the puck, take it to the net. You know, keep it super simple. But um, anyway, that's that's where I stand, sit right now. Is um, I agree with your assessment that the Abs are 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 fast. Yeah, I mean, the Oilers are obviously really mm-hmm. fast too. But um, and then the Oilers have some fast second line wingers in McLeod and Fogel now. But I I would like to see Holloway out there, and I'd like to see Philip Broberg. Yeah, well, they, the guy. I mean, they keep adding guys that can fly, like Miles Wood. You know, uh, not a great player, but he brings speed to a depth line. Andrew Cogliano brings speed to a depth line. It seems like there are guys flying around, and Sean Walker brings speed to the defense, as he showed a couple times tonight, jumping into the play and scoring goals, getting a breakaway in overtime, nearly scoring a hat trick. Yeah, another fast yeah. defenseman they just brought in, right? Like he looked like he could move. Mm-hmm. So Broberg uh, has got and they 23 moved points. out a young defenseman in Bowen Byram and replaced him with yeah. a little more veteran guy, right? I, I like Bowen Byram. Yeah, Broberg has 23 points in 36 games now in the AHL, and he's plus 14. So he's killing it down there, obviously. That's all the reports say he's killing it. He's back from injury now. And um, yeah, let them play. Let them keep playing, but bring them up. Bring them up uh, in a few weeks, if you can, and integrate mm-hmm. them into the lineup because Cody CC may not cut it, and um, and um, Carrick may not cut it, and Corey Perry may not cut it. Like Corey Perry is definitely a fourth line player now, and and we saw tonight what he brings to it. He's such a smart gamer of a hockey player, but. I, I just think, from what I've seen of Holloway this year, they need him in the lineup. They need that speed that he can bring. And and I like him. I don't mind Holloway at center. I mean, I don't think he'll be the center. It'll be Ryan or Carrick on the fourth line, but um, I'd like to see Holloway on the, with them. So, Final thoughts, mm-hmm. Bruce? Back at him. Take your one point and uh, move on. Yeah. And- I think that tonight's loss makes the likelihood of Edmonton uh, starting its potential Colorado series at home a lot less likely. Uh, that said, the home ice advantage hasn't seemed to mean a whole lot in this particular series. Edmonton's had more success at Denver than they have here in recent years against them, it seems to me. 91 points in 68 games, the Avs. Hmm. The Oilers, 84 points in 65 games. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, they're a scary team. There's lots of scary. Bruce, there are so many. There are lots of scary teams in the Western Conference. It's it is going to be a heck of a battle for the Oilers. Yeah, every series, like we, I mean, we're looking ahead to round three in the hypothetical. There's zero guarantee either team makes it that far, but it's certainly possible. They're yeah, two, two Western powers. There's no doubt about that, but they're not the only two. And and injury is going to play a huge factor um, with yeah. both teams. So um, we'll see how that plays out as well. You have no idea what's going to be how that's going to factor into things. All right, Bruce. Well, let's leave it there tonight. Thanks for talking. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.